Sure. The following interview was conducted with Daryl Lee, Professor Emeritus of Earth Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, August the 9th, 2010 at his residence, also sitting in as his wife, Myra. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Lee. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for coming. Okay. Let's talk about, tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born in Huntington, West Virginia in 1937, October 19th, 1937. And my two parents were Ivan and Bertie Leap, and they were from that area. Dad, my dad was from Wayne County, originally, which is borders Cabell County, where I was born. My mom was from Lincoln County, which also borders it. And uh, so then, after I was born, then uh, five years later, she had twins, twin boys, Carl and Keith. Were they identical or fraternal? Fraternal, fraternal twins. And um, Carl became an educator, <coughs> got a degree, got degrees in education administration, and then he was principal of high schools in uh, Kentucky and Virginia, and also taught in West Virginia, in Huntington, and um, then his brother, Keith, uh, became, uh, went, well, he was in Vietnam, in the Army in Vietnam. When he came back, he uh, went to Theological Seminary at Asbury Theological Seminary and became an ordained Methodist pastor when he just retired last year and still lives in Huntington. Carl, unfortunately, uh, passed away this past May from, uh, he had cancer with complications from that. And uh, so Keith, Keith and I are the only ones left now. Okay. What was grade school like? And then talk a little bit about high school. Well, grade school is a lot different than grade school we are today. We, it was a country school. It was uh, one of the bigger of the country schools, white frame, the concrete block uh, walls in the basement. It had a basement, it had the, which we used as sort of a gym, I guess you'd call it. And when I first started going there, we had to uh, take our own lunches. Well, our uh, toilet facilities were interesting. They were outdoor privies, and one for the boys and one for the girls. And uh, wow. so the teachers were no-nonsense teachers, you know. But we didn't have the audio-visual and uh, fun and games that they have in school today, or computers, of course. But uh, I got a good solid education as a as a uh, student there, went through all six grades, and then went on to junior high school, which is somewhat improved, and then from there on to high school. But anyway, uh, it was an interesting experience. And fortunately for me, if I got sick or if I once did, I fell down and banged my head on a concrete step and knocked myself out. And my grandmother lived next door to the school, so I could whisk me up there real quick, and my mom could come over and get me. But it was an interesting experience. I think uh, I spent all six years there. Started when I was uh, six. I guess that was in 1942, and uh, then that was during the war years. What was the war years like down in the Korean? Well, a lot of the young men went to war. Uh, a lot of them did come back, uh, and but anyway, the people in West Virginia were all, have always been very patriotic in supporting our troops and so forth, and they, as they are now. Sure. And uh, we had scrap drives, so we had piles of scrap metal. I mean, farmers would bring in broken utensils, old plows, uh, pieces of metal, and we'd have worn out, busted up bicycles, little red wagons, all kinds of junk and that could be made into steel. Sure. And then we had paper drives where right. we would have uh, stacks and stacks and stacks of papers to be sent overseas, to, well, sent to the Army. <coughs> and uh, every now and then we were staying out in the uh, the uh, schoolyard, you know, at recess or Lunchtime, we were playing marbles. I haven't seen a kid play marbles in years and years and years. That was a lot of fun. Of course, you got down and got in the dirt, and boys like to do that, you know. We'd come in looking like pigs, and the teachers would kind of turn up their noses at us, but we had a lot of fun. Then we, those of us, a few of us had little toy cars and trucks. We had an embankment there where we'd go up and, 
and uh, all dirt down the road, you know, and pretend, pretend we were making the highway. And then, uh, every now and then we hear a drone of airplanes look up, it'd be a formation of bombers or fighters flying overhead, transferring from one place to another. They come right over. And, uh, yeah, I can remember those big old airplanes. And, uh, Was there a base near, not too far? Or? No, the nearest, um, I think the National Guard Base, Air National Guard Base is at Charleston, which oh, okay. was about 50 or 55 miles away, okay. so they'd fly up over our place. Yeah. But it was uh, interesting, and uh, our fifth grade teacher, fifth and sixth grade teacher, was a Mr. Fisher, and he was also principal. <coughs> and so he had been in the Navy during, this was after the war, and he was in the Navy, and he worked on top secret development of radar. And boy, we boys just thought that was the coolest thing in the world, you know. So I got interested in electricity when I was about, oh, fifth grade, I guess, and telegraph sets. And so I kind of talked some other boys into it. So, you know, let's go talk to Mr. Fisher about it. So we, he explained to us everything about polarity and current, amperage, voltage, and all that stuff. And so we would went to our respective homes and daddy's garages, and we would uh, take a piece of pine board two big nails and uh, wrap them with wire, we usually get lamp cord wire or if we were love if we could afford it we'd get telephone wire. Dry cell batteries and then hook up the clappers and the keys. And so he let us bring them to, to class. Now this is something you'd never see today. I mean this is just this is back in the dark ages. But he, we took them to class and he allowed us each to have one and the one we'd made on our desk. And we ran wires from our telegraph sets to the other telegraph sets. Well, when you walked down the aisle, you had to kind of step over the wires. <laughs> Can you imagine that happening today with OSHA and all well, that And stuff. no duct tape. No duct tape. And no duct tape, exactly. Duct tape was, uh, had not even been dreamed of, I guess, at that time. And uh, I don't even know if scotch tape was in then or not. But anyway, we had, uh, we had a lot of fun with those things. We learned so much. We'd sure. pretend that we were... Uh, you know, we'd seen uh, newsreels of people in um, intelligence to be behind enemy lines and tap it out information to go to the good guys. So we right. pretended that we were behind enemy lines and getting all that information and tapping it out. You know, and we had a lot of fun with it. But finally, he said, "Well, he said, guys, I think you've had it in here long enough. <laughs> I think you're going to have to take these things home." <laughs> and so uh, one of the interesting things was when uh, I got on the bus with mine, mine to take it to school the first time, uh, it had two coils and then the clapper came down, tick, 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 tick. And I got on the school bus and we had a rather rustic country bump for a driver. This was out in the country, I mean, this was way out in the country, back in the hills. He, I got on board of that thing, and he looked at me, what in the hell is that contraption? I said, why, uh, that's an atom smasher. He looked at me like, he didn't know an atom smasher from anything. So anyway, I said, what you do, you take, you take an atom and put it on the top of these, one of these poles here, and you hit the button, and this clapper comes down and smashes the atom. And he looked at me, and he, and they were asking more questions. <laughs> it took care of him and made his day. <laughs> yeah. Right. But anyway, it was interesting growing up there. Sure. And we're mostly kids that lived on farms, small farmers, large farms. We had a small farm about, oh, I don't know, maybe a mile from the school. And my grandfather had a big dairy farm right up the road from us, so I, I came from a dairy farming family. And we had cows and pigs and chickens and horses and uh, and what have you, and uh, my job as the oldest kid in the family is to go out and milk the cows every morning. We usually had a couple of them, chop the hogs, get the eggs, feed the chickens, and then help. We always had a big vegetable garden, and uh, we well the whole that was a big family affair. We all got involved in plowing up the ground, planting the seed. It was well, so those were big. The victory garden gardening was was very popular. Well, it was very popular then, yeah, in our they neighborhood would, they had yeah. one too. Yeah. We carried over into uh, after long after that, even when I was in high school, we still had a big vegetable garden. Of course my mom was an outstanding cook and she canned and froze stuff and uh, she also dried a lot of stuff like beans. She would dry beans. 
and uh, put them on a cheesecloth and put them up in the attic and let them just dry out. Huh. And then we'd get them down later on and put a big slab of ham or bacon or something in there and cook them when they were really good. They had a different flavor than fresh green beans. They were called leather breeches. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not, but leather breeches were dried beans. And they had a real good, sort of a musky, different taste. Hmm. But I enjoyed it. And of course, we had a, my mom would make a lot of soups with her vegetables. And I imagine that. In the spring, she and the other ladies around would go out and hunt greens, wild greens. And we had fresh greens in the spring. And it was, it was a good life. I was in 4 H. Am I going to No, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> I was in 4 H for, I don't know, two or three years. And, uh, one year, I made an elect electrical lamp, a cord lamp and all that stuff. It wasn't a very, it was a pretty simple thing. But it, uh, another year, I uh, trapped muskrats. Oops. And, uh, of course, I, you know, that's very politically incorrect these days. But Anyway, I made enough money from furs to buy a watch. I was pretty proud of myself. <laughs> well, sure, you made your own money. You bought something you wanted. Yeah, looking back on it, though, that was a pretty cruel way to catch an animal. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was fun. And uh, then later on, uh, I got a little older than my 4-H project. The final one was uh, I raised a uh, purebred registered Holstein heifer. And... Uh, Called her Bonnie. She had a long, long name, Bonnie or Bonnie or something like that, and we just called her Bonnie. And uh, took her to the fair. Well, one kid down the road raised, raised an Angus uh, beef cow. So I took her to the fair and won Grand Champion Prize with her because she was the best looking cow in the whole crowd. We'd, I mean, no cow in the face of the earth, including all the sacred cows of India, had ever had so much personal attention. I mean, I fed her and I pulled, fed her and I took a curry comb and I'd curry her hide, you know, and wash her down. And and then she start, she would follow me around, you know, just like a, like a dog. <laughs> she was a pet. Well, finally the time came when we kids who had these animals had to sell them. That was part of the contract. And it just about broke my heart to sell Bonnie. And, uh, but we sold her to a really modern, nice, big dairy farm. Uh, oh, a few miles from home from where we live. Mr. Thornburg had a big farm and uh, he had a whole bunch of cows. The drive by is a beautiful place. I thought, well, you know, Bonnie will have lots of friends down there with those cows. <laughs> That's why I didn't feel so bad about it. Another family. Another family, sure. yeah. Uh, so, go ahead. No, go ahead. That went to high school and then go on to college. Okay, yeah, I went into high school. Yeah. And, uh, Served and played in the senior play. In fact, we're having our high school reunion come up here in about two weeks, the uh, 55th, uh, 55th high school anniversary. I always love to go back to those things. We haven't been for five years you know, to see my friends again and got to feel like, well, I'm not the only one that's getting old. I've got buddies here that are doing the same thing. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, I went to high school and was elected the uh, Best actor, because I was in the senior play. And then from there, I went to college, went to Marshall University, went to Marshall College, which is now Marshall University. And I graduated in 1960. And then, uh, after, well, in the spring of 1960, I joined the Navy Reserve. And uh, then, after I graduated, I immediately went up to the Navy base in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, to Officer Candidate School, and spent four months in the summer at Officer Candidate School. And then in October, October the 14th, I believe, in 1960, I was commissioned as an ensign. And then, uh, let's see, flew over to catch my ship in Athens, Greece. And it was put on a port of Piraeus, which is the port of Athens. And then we sailed across the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal, down the Red Sea, and around through the Arabian Sea, and around the tip of uh, Arabia and then up the Persian Gulf and we did oceanographic surveying of the Persian Gulf and uh, I was made captain of a 60-foot uh, boat. We had four of those 60-foot cabin boats that, with us and uh, we went out and 
survey thousands of miles of sounding lines of sonar, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And electronic positioning gear. And so I have helped to chart a lot of previously uncharted waters of the Persian Gulf, and it was really dangerous. I mean, there were reefs there we didn't know about. One of the skippers hit a reef one night and broke off both of his rudders. Unfortunately, he had two propellers so he could speed one up and slow one down and steer the boat with. I had a crew of eight people, eight sailors on board. I mean, it was pretty self-contained. We had a galley, we had eight bunks below. We had uh, a head, we call it, which is a toilet with the handle, pump flush type thing. We had a big refrigerator, a big reefer in the back under the deck, under the, the tail fan head. We kept in frozen meat, fresh meats and stuff like that. So we'd go out and work for about two weeks at a time by ourselves and in the evenings we'd try to find a nice sheltered cove someplace and go in and drop the anchor and then fish. We had a little eight foot boat wherry I guess they called it. It was uh, aboard these little boats. So sometimes we'd just anchor and row to shore and you know, explore the place. They had a lot of fun, a very, very interesting experience. So now when I see <coughs> the conflicts in the Persian Gulf and I see the big battleships and aircraft carriers and destroyers and cruisers and the rest of them going in there, I think they're going in there on the charts that I helped to make. And I felt pretty darn good about it. I would think so, right. Yeah. I always said, I always hoped though that I put those reefs in the right spots because I wouldn't want to hang up a shipload of Marines <laughs> on a reef someplace. <laughs> Uh, it wouldn't make me very popular with the Marines. <laughs> but anyway, I stayed in there. I, I, I got off of active service in 1960, late 1963, and went back to Marshall for a year to take up some uh, courses I thought I would need for graduate school. And then in 1964, I went to Indiana University and was there from 64 to 66. Uh, got a master's degree in geology. And after that, I went to work for. Uh, South Dakota State Geological Survey in Vermilion, and I also was a part-time instructor in the Department of Geology there for about three years. And after that, then I went to Penn State and was there for four years, got my PhD. And then from there, I went out to Denver, Colorado to work as a hydrologist for the United States Geological Survey. That was a great experience, but my field area was in Southern Nevada on the the uh, Nevada test site specifically, and the environs off it. So it was something that required a top secret clearance, a Q clearance, and then I had to uh, be careful with radiation and so sure. forth. Uh, but then I had an experimental site off the test site where I did a lot of my own research work for the USGS, but yet it wasn't right on the test site. But I spent a lot of time on the test site. So finally I decided I'd had enough with the government. It was fun, but I, my heart had been in going back to academia. So I toyed with the idea and found in the trade journal, found an advertisement for a position open for an assistant professor. Found the <coughs> position open for a assistant professor at uh, Purdue, and I didn't thought, well, I don't have a Chinaman, so that's not a good term to use. I don't have a chance of a snowball you know, where I get that job. I'm 42 years old, but I thought if I don't take this job, if it comes available, if I do take it, that'll be the last chance I'll ever have at my age to get a, to get a uh, position. So anyway, I applied, and they asked me to come in and give them a talk. And so I did, and I gave my, my uh, talk was on uh, geological disposition, disposal of uh, radio, high level radioactive waste, like the power plants and stuff like that, which I was working on quite a bit in a matter of two or three years in my career with the survey. In fact, I was one of the early workers on the uh, Yucca Mountain site that you've been probably read about in the paper where they want to put the high level waste, and uh, did quite a bit of work around there. But anyway, they finally called me back about, I don't know, a month, six weeks later, and said, we got to give you the job. So uh, I was a pretty happy guy then. 
So then I had to chase around and... Uh, you were married, of course, at that time. Well, I had actually been been divorced. I was oh, okay. divorced with another wife in 1977. So I was by myself, my house, in Lakewood, which is a nice suburb, nice place. And I really hated to leave Colorado. I love that place. But I love to ski, and I love the scenery, I love to drive out through and hike, you know. Sure. But I thought, I'm never going to get another job like this. So I left, and from friends of mine, in fact, he's a professor at Indiana University, they were out work, he was out working for the uh, survey uh, for the summer, and so I let them rent the house. So I took out what I immediately needed, put in a U-Haul trailer, and like books, books and stuff like that, and then I drove cross country, and then later on, a few weeks later when the movers came, then my friends there helped put everything away, including the big piano and you know, all that stuff. So I left on July the 4th, 1980, and arrived in uh, Lafayette in, uh, on July the 6th, 1980. And, uh, where'd you live? Where was your housing? Where'd you live when you first came here? Did you get an apartment? Or no, uh, I had an apartment. It was a whole house that had apartments. It was the cheapest apartment I could find. And it didn't require a lease because I was hoping to sell my house very soon, but it did. It took longer than I expected. The one in Colorado? Right in Colorado. Uh -huh. So I did. I found this uh, this apartment, and one of the secretaries of my department, Earth Atmospheric Sciences, it was called Geosciences then, she uh, lived upstairs, so she told me about this apartment. It was, yeah, well, it was a small, very low efficiency sure. apartment, but it, it worked. And uh, interestingly enough, my next door neighbor was none other than Myra. That's how we met. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's what brought you to Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> Back a magnet, told me. Yeah, right. And uh, so uh, eventually... You're ready to start then in September teaching, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went out and met, I was here about 10 days, then I was sent to Montana for six weeks to teach a geology field course out there with uh, for undergraduate students. And uh, did that twice, I did it in 80 and 81. It was kind of fun, a lot of hard work, but it was really a lot of fun with the kids. You know. and of course, it was, as I got older, a little harder and harder to keep up with the 19, 20 year olds and put them down the mountains. <laughs> Those mountains are pretty steep and pretty high. But anyway, we had a, I had a great experience. And uh, Tell us a about your, and particularly some of your research, and talk about that tritium lab, I guess you were. Yes, the tritium. Key. Mm -hmm. Tritium is radioactive hydrogen, which occurs right. naturally. Part of it is just, just made naturally in the atmosphere by cosmic ray bombardment. And then uh, a lot of it comes from uh, fallout from hydrogen bomb tests that occurred in the late 50s, early 60s by the United States, Russia, and China. And so that stuff is still in the atmosphere. It's pretty harmless because it's a very low activity type of stuff that doesn't really bother. We're getting bombarded with it. We breathe it, we drink it, and everything else. But it has a half life of 12.4 years. And we know what the, what the decay rate is. And of course, it's gradually decaying. But it makes an ideal atmospheric tracer or environmental tracer for water. For water. Not only water that's falling as rain, but also that's flowing in streams and gets into ponds. Because by analyzing the tritium in the uh, water that rains down or in the groundwater, we can get, get an age of how old that stuff is. And so we can know the, how long it's been since the water is recharged. And that's very important for looking at water supply and also for tracking contamination. So anyway, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Steve Fritz, who's passed away since then, uh, he went, did his postgraduate work up in the University of Waterloo in Canada, which had an outstanding department. And he was working with Tritium up there and knew a man who uh, could put this thing together for us. So we wrote up some grant proposals and uh, got enough money to build one. So we took a room in the uh, civil engineering building that now houses the Earth Atmospheric Sciences Building. And we had this guy come down and he put it together for us. And so we used that for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And then we had a counter in another room uh, 
scintillation counter, which was in a shielded room to prevent cosmic rays from messing things up. And uh, well, we count we count this stuff that way. So it was a it was a very uh, very unique lab. I think it was probably at the time a state of the art lab. Sure. One of the best in the country. Is it still is it still in operation? No, it's oh. all gone now. So okay. uh, my colleague Steve Fritz, he died, and uh, and, uh, and after I I moved out before he died, but then they finally just disbanded the whole oh, thing. Okay. So, yeah. and, uh, so uh, then. Uh, what were some of the other, there was a similar research, any other research, uh, you were primarily on hydrology and... Uh, hydrology, modeling, yeah, modeling yeah, I did a lot, yeah, I did a lot of work on, uh, for Purdue, <coughs> Purdue University had some landfills on the Thomas Farm and the horticulture farm that somebody said was contaminating everything, so before that I'd had a couple of graduate students working on delineating and studying the aquifer that supplies Purdue University with its groundwater. And uh, so the uh, administration knew I'd worked on that, so they asked me if I would be willing to take on this big project. And so they gave me all kinds of money. I mean, we had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars and bought equipment, you know, and paid for students, and paid for uh, uh, just a lot of things. So, yeah, but it was it, key. It was significant, you know. Oh yeah, I mean it was very significant. Sure. Well, as it turned out, it turned out to be a tennis and a teacup because there was no contamination. The but only then thing again, you wouldn't have, you don't know until you didn't that's you right. check it. Would never have known that until we checked it out. We drilled holes. I don't know. Probably we drilled dozens of holes and put in sampling wells. Um, we did a lot of work sampling sediments from the creek. Um, sampling soil and so forth and uh, the only thing we found that was not our fault was not well it was not due to the landfills but on the horticulture farm and the orchard we did find a rather high concentration of lead in the soil and that's because they use a, a legal insecticide called lead arsenate to control weevils and stuff and also, that's also used not only in commercial orchards, but also is used in big cotton fields to control the bull weevil. But the thing about the lead is that as long as the water in the soil, soil stays a bit alkaline, that is a PhD uh, higher than seven, then that lead will just lock up and won't, the clay will hold it and it won't go anywhere. And, but other than that, that was all we found. The streams are clean. Um, you know, we've we found uh, we found no contamination uh, at all that could be attributed to the uh, landfills. But I think what we did find was some, some stuff like ethyl benzene that may have probably could have been probably was uh, put in the atmosphere by. Uh, incomplete combustion of gasoline because ethyl benzene is one of the primary constituents of modern gasolines. And we found methylene chloride, but that may have been due to a certain industry, which I won't mention, that uh, has put a lot of that in the atmosphere. But I don't know. If yeah. here. But anyway. Is that near the, uh, where the apple, where they used to have the apples out there, the hort? Is that what you're talking about? In yeah, the that's, yeah, the hort farm is where right. the apples are. Right. The apples Those were are. really good. You know, they least, were, yeah. I was really sad that they get get away with that. I mean, I thought well, that was... That's yeah, they've been there forever. Terrible. I used to go out there every, you know, every year and get yes, you get apples and cider, oh, yeah. pears, chestnuts. Yeah, right. uh, it was great. I loved it. But, yeah. but anyway, uh, have you done any uh, other consulting work? Say anything for the community? Or oh yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of consulting work. Oh. Uh, uh, I've done work for. Well, I've done a lot of work on contamination and the groundwater contamination. For example, I was involved in a, about three different uh, projects for the people of uh, Benton County, uh, St. Joseph County, and Cass County, and Carroll County, concerning looking at the possibilities of contamination from these 
from confined feeding operations like big dairy farms they want to put in, you know, thousands of animals and manure after the year, years, you know. And I just told them, I said, you know, we did a lot of studies and uh, testified and gave the depositions that this is just a, this is madness because this, these fields you want to put this stuff on get wet. The water table is practically at the surface. I remember at the Benton County, they wanted to put a landfill right on the surface and the water table was right at the surface. Well, we could replumb the county. Uh, yeah, he can do a lot of that, but I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So anyway, I was successful, like I and others, in helping to defeat those things. Good. And then I've done consulting work for uh, uh, a company that was working on the uh, trichloroethylene contamination over in Lafayette. Back all oh, several years ago, there was a plant over there that had used trichloroethylene in its uh, cutting oil, cutting uh, cutting metal, and uh, they put the cuttings out in a big bin outside, and completely an innocent thing, nobody knew any difference. And the rain would come down and take the trichloroethylene and put it in the groundwater, and away she'd go toward the city wells. Well, uh, that turned out to be a Cinderella story because the company was very responsible. They put in a lot of extraction wells and so forth, and now the trichloroethylene is down to practically nothing and saved the wells. And uh, so I've been involved in all well, several other things. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in a big lawsuit up in uh, Jasper Newton County. So the insurance company has a lot of land that they irrigate the corn. And the farmers were complaining that, excuse me, it was causing their corn to burn up. Well, I and a couple of other guys, professors from Purdue and one from Indiana University, got involved in it. And we went up and put all kinds of sampling wells in, the sampling tubes and soil moisture uh, detectors and all that sort of thing. And the only thing we could find is that what was causing the corn to burn up was that when they planted the corn up on a high knoll on sandy soil, the sandy soil just does not hold water. It goes right on through it. Very porous. Very, yeah, and uh, very high permeability. And uh, so in the heat of the summer in July and August, uh, there was just no water for corn to burn up. And so, but anyway, there was a big lawsuit, and uh, I think we finally settled out of court. But, uh, but anyway, I was involved in a lot of those things, and uh, I was involved in, uh, well, gosh, I can't remember all of them right offhand, but several things. Oh, I was ones, right. yeah. you know, involved in a bottle of water project up in Peru, Indiana, and uh, I think I've got probably one coming up next spring. I haven't been doing any for the last year. Yeah. But, uh, what about, uh, let's talk about, about the department. Um, I had forgotten, but originally it was geosciences, and then were you there at the time? They, why was the name changed, or had yeah. that happened before you? Come? Well, I was called the Department of Geosciences. Okay. <coughs> and we, of course, we had not only geology, but we also had atmospheric sciences, climatology, and all that, meteorology, that sort of thing. Right. And so the, the atmospheric people thought, well, that doesn't really give us any right. any attention. So a big move went afoot to change the name to the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Well, we toyed with names for a while, what to call it. And so in a faculty meeting, sort of tongue in cheek, I said, well, look, since we deal with earth and volcanoes, hydrology, and atmospheric sciences, why don't we use the Aristotelian, I think it was Aristotle, Aristotle would say this, about the four elements, call it the Department of Earth, Air, Fire, and Water. Not a lot of last, but nothing else. <laughs> well, well, that's in essence what you're trying to say, yeah. right? So we made it the Department of Earth Atmosphere Sciences. So yeah, that, that happy. sounds pretty good. Everybody's happy. How has the uh, department changed? Any any comment? The department has the current head is Larry Braille, isn't it? I think the current. No, head. he uh, oh. he stepped down. Oh, okay. Time right out. The current the current uh, department head is John Harbor. Oh, okay. J O N is the way he's going. Brilliant, brilliant young man from England, but he uh, got his degrees here, both of them are here. And uh, he is now, he's also been elected to the Royal Geographical Society of Great Britain 
I got he's just an outstanding person. He uh, he came from Kent State. I was chairman of the search department for a new professor. So he contacted me and looked at his resume and he looked real good so we had him come over to give some talks and boy he was just he sold her money so anyway, we took him on and he's just gone skyward ever since and uh, he's, he's, a, he's a very fine man and I think the department is extremely fortunate to have him as right. a department head. He's, he's, he's an academic to be sure but he's also a very congenial personable type of person. Personable person, yeah. But uh, yeah, well, I'm very happy for him to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, what sort of positions do some of the students uh, go into? Uh, oh, they go into a lot of different okay. things from the department in general. A lot of them go into industry, oil companies, mining companies. A lot of them go into environmental sciences, environmental geosciences. I've done a lot of work in that kind of area sure. too. And uh, I have a my last graduate student was a Mexican fellow <clears throat> and he came here from the University of Oregon he came here for his master's degree and I begged him to stay on for a PhD he was just so bright and brilliant and he wanted to go, out and go to work so he works for a big company up in uh, the Chicago area southwest of Chicago and big consulting firm one of the biggest in the world and uh, he's doing very very well and the next fact, the fact is that they can use him now and Latin America and Central America because of his Spanish ability. Sure. So he goes down there quite often. And uh, well, if there's a problem here in the States where they need a Spanish speaker, they will send him. So he's done extremely well. And then I have one student who's working for a consulting firm in, in Indianapolis, another who went to work for the um, Desert Research Institute at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. I've got one who's a uh, Professor now at uh, Georgia Southern University and uh, Statesboro University, uh, Statesboro, Georgia. Well, I got uh, one who is a professor at the National Chen Kung University in Taiwan. He is a Chinese, a Taiwanese fellow. And then I have two Koreans who are professors of big universities in Korea, I mean, well, Korea, South Korea, one of which is Seoul National University, which is probably the Harvard of Korea and maybe a top competitor for Beijing University. I was visited there several years ago and I had a great time. And then, I've, of course, I've had, those are the ones I personally supervised. Of course, I've been on committees of oh, dozens. Sure, so. sure. And uh, one young lady uh, got her PhD and she's working for the Texas Water Board at uh, Austin, Texas, with the mathematical simulations of water flow in the big Edwards Aquifer and things like that. It's uh, pretty good. So well, I get a whole jobs, bunch of, are, jobs are pretty good. Well, they were when I was there. Uh, yeah. I think they still are. Uh, they still are still are obtainable. So I turned out in my career. I turned out twenty-one graduate students, um, fourteen of which were masters and seven were PhDs. Very good. Of my own students. Right. That's good. Um, a family. Talk about the family. You got uh, any? You have a wife, and you have any children? No, we don't have any okay. children. Okay, okay. Um, the alumni participation certainly at, at your school. You still participate? Just yeah, I still there? participate in my yeah. alma mater and yeah. the high school. How many uh, still around from your class? Uh, quite a few. How many were? Do you remember how many in your class? I don't remember exactly, but I would say probably two thirds of them are still there. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, this, that's just an estimate. A lot of them have passed on. They, of course, the, the bittersweet thing about reunions, school re high, especially high school reunions for people of my age, yeah. is the fact that uh, there are lots of fun to go to, uh, but every time you go back for one, it's a little bittersweet because somebody's passed on. You know? That's right. Yeah. So we have them every five years. Now, I also like my Navy reunions. We have those every two years. Last summer, Oh, nine, we had it in Marietta, Ohio, on the Ohio River, which is a beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, then we've had them in various other places. And so next year, and uh, I think... Is that just every, every two years? Every two years. Okay. Every May of uh, 2011, it's going to be at Charleston, South Carolina. Ooh. So they always try to get uh, a Navy reunion on water. 
either the ocean or a river. Sure. You can't. You got to get the sailors on the water again. So we'll usually have a dinner cruise or a luncheon cruise or something like that. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Yeah. But they're going to. They're fading. Right. Um, awards? Any awards and honors that you would like to share with us? Teaching or um, maybe some. Uh, now also, I can say you were one of the founding members of the American Hydrology Society. Correct. I was one of the early members, yeah. yeah. American the American Institute of Hydrology. I got see, I've got uh, words. Uh, of course, I had my resume with me. Yeah, I've that's got two or three, but I can't remember the names of them. That's okay. Uh, How about a Purdue tradition? Since you've been here, any tradition that comes to mind? Purdue Tradu Tradu tradition, such as tradition. the little boilermaker special or commencement. People like commencement. Um, I always enjoyed the commencements. They were very elegant and done very, very well. Right. Um, the music was always good, and I always enjoyed the Glee Club and the Purdueettes. Sure. And um, I'm, I'm in the music, so it's one of my hobbies right now that I'm retired. But um, I don't know. I think that. Uh, yeah, I think commencement was a was a great fun thing yeah. to do, and then uh, uh, a few basketball games I attended. I like those, but uh, that's, that's I think, of course, back then too. I kind of at that time I kind of looked forward to school starting. Sure, I think, I understand. Uh, yeah. uh, what about a? Um, you have any hobbies? Um, yes. Yeah, yes, I have music composition as one, and woodworking as another. What, well, that's about what, what are you on. currently working on for woodworking? Well, right now, not much of anything. I'm trying to get my shop rearranged, and I've got to do some work on my harpsichord that I built. I'm going to do some, take it apart and do some minor repairs to it. Researchers, he built a harpsichord, and it's right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like to buy a build, build another one, too, uh, one of these days, <laughs> uh, once I get my shop completely set up. But... Um, well, that, that keeps you that, busy. That keeps me busy. Right. Uh, it's enjoyable stuff. Right. Know. How about an outstanding event? At Purdue? Anything. Doesn't have to, have to be Purdue related. Sometimes you can have, a lot of people say, I only have, I have more than one. You can have whatever comes to mind. Well, I guess the first one that I was saying event would be getting my PhD. It was such a struggle to get a year or to do it. But the, one, the bad thing was that... Um, <coughs> I was living in Denver then, and I bought a house, and I'd spent some money to go back and see my father who was dying, and so he died shortly after I got the degree. But anyway, I just didn't have the money to go to Penn State for the ceremonies, and I've kicked myself ever since then that I was so conservative I didn't borrow it. I should have borrowed the money from a bank and gone. And I've really regretted that since then. Well, that's the first thing. And then the next thing, I guess, would be getting married, meeting, meeting my wife. Uh, it was really a fluke. Here we were, lived across the hall from each other. And turns out she's an excellent musician, an excellent pianist. And so that kind of the music kind of got us together. That's what the glue or the, at least the bait that kind that of got us together. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Then you sort of covered some of the things you're doing in your retirement the activities. Anything uh, other that. To, uh, you'd like to share with us? Doing any traveling at all, or have been? Uh, I have done a little. I have, of course. I, when I was uh, teaching, I did a lot of traveling, international as well sure. as national traveling, but not so much now, except going back home or going to a reunion right. or uh, going to the Navy reunion. Um, we've been thinking about taking a cruise. I'd like to take a cruise. Not a long cruise, but a nice cruise in the ocean. And uh, but other than that, we don't do much traveling. Right. Just uh, there's a lot of things to do around here. Oh yeah. Anything I forgot to ask, or anything in summary that you'd like that I may have forgotten? To leave it up to you. Well, I forgot exactly what the wards were. I was uh, well, I was the uh, governor by put me on the uh, name me as a member of the Indiana Hazardous Waste Siting Facility Authority. Indiana Hazardous Waste Facility Siting Authority. So I served on that for a few years, and uh, I, we happened to put a stop to a very dangerous landfill up in uh, New Haven, Indiana. And uh, we 
wish I had my resume with me. That's okay. Uh, but anyway, that was one. And, uh, that sounds good. Did anything I forgot to ask you think that you can think of? Um, we, uh, of course, I'd lived in Colorado for six and a half years before I met Myra. So in 1985, <clears throat> I took her out there on a vacation. And we hiked and we went all over the mountains. We had a friend, she used to work with a professor at the foreign languages where she was, what was your title, the department and system? Foreign language. And so one of the professors there was from Colorado, and he owned a, owned a house, a cabin up in the mountains in Park County, which is right in the center of Colorado. So we stayed there for a few days, and while we were there, I told her, I said, I'd like to buy some land up here. So we went out shopping, and we found 36 acres in the mountains, 10,000 feet above sea level. And oh, it was great. It was right next to a national forest full of animals, uh, beautiful scenery. So we paid that off and then we decided to build a house. So we had a house built and she and I did a lot of the interior work. Flooring, cabinets, uh, this, that, the other. Uh, some of the wall, the wall coverings and so on. But they did a really fine, it was a beautiful house and it uh, was very well constructed, ex exceptionally well constructed. And so we've been going out there for in the summers for uh, several years, and I guess the house was finished about 1999, 2000, mm, 2001. 2001, okay. And we would go out there every summer until 19, uh, until, 19 to, to, until 2008, and it finally got to be just too much. Uh, we, all we do when we went out there was work, and. Uh, Things needed to be done, huh? Things needed to be done. And uh, the altitude was starting to affect both of us. No. Was there any other, were there any other neighbors nearby? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. yeah, but distantly. There was one about a half a mile down the road. And okay. One about a quarter mile up the road, but of course they don't come there all the time. Sure. You know? But there were a lot of critters around there. Of course, I kept guns with me in case a mountain lion or a bear thought to get too friendly or something. But uh, it got to the point where, at that high altitude, our house sat, at the, sat right out the 10,000 foot contour line. And for the first several years, we could handle it. But the last year was 2007, and I started to really feel it. So I talked to a nurse that happened to live in town, we knew, and she said, well, out here, she says, you'll find that people can usually live with the altitude until about the age of 70. And at that age, then, you'll see a lot of them leave. And that's why you don't see hardly and maybe one or two people in town 70 or over. They all go down to Lower Alvin. So I thought, well, this is only going to get worse. And it's very uncomfortable sitting there when you're even relaxing. You feel like you've got to gasp for breath. So we decided, well, after much discussion, we decided to sell it. And... It was painful. <laughs> oh, I know. It was very painful. But at the same time, we sold it at the right time. We closed on the house in January 2008, and it was just a few days, less than a week, I think maybe a week, before the uh, uh, real estate market went into the tank. We were very, very fortunate for that. Yeah. And made a good profit, and uh, so we've invested that money, and. Uh, a lot of memories well. on pictures, huh? It worked out well. It worked out well, yeah. 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 <laughs> Definitely, I, uh, go ahead. I still would like to take a trip out to Colorado here one of these days, maybe this spring. Right. I'll visit Just the, driving through, you know, and getting out and walking around probably be all right. <laughs> Dr. Lee, I want to thank you very much. This was very, very nice. Well, and thank Myra, you. Myra, thank you for sitting in, and your two cats. Okay. <laughs> Glad to help you out. <laughs>